Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the UCCS Speaker <laughs> Series. For those of you who are here uh, with us in person and those of, uh, those of you joining us by Zoom, um, welcome. Um, this is the first segment of a six-part UC Center Sacramento series on artificial intelligence. Um, we've, for the past several seasons, focused our attention during winter quarter on a single topic, and this is our topic this year. It's a really interesting time in history because in the space of 15 years, we've seen two technological innovations that have literally changed the way we exist and, and interact as humans. First, uh, in 2007, there was the uh, iPhone. It's hard to believe that it was only, what, 15 years ago? Uh, and after that, the ensuing rise in social media, which has really totally altered the social landscape, our political discourse, and, um, and has certainly changed the lives of our children and teens. And then, in November 2022, the launch of ChatGPT, which was the first of several large language models that are already changing the way we acquire uh, information, the way we solve problems, the way we educate students, and the way we conduct our politics. So the purpose of this UCCS symposium is to provide a 360 degree view of AI, considering its implications for education, health, criminal justice, the economy, and society at large. We've worked to bring you six of the University of California's leading experts on these topics uh, in the hope that they will provide some context for understanding what is happening and where things might go. So here to kick off our series is Dr. Brandy Nanaki. Dr. Nanaki is founding director of the Citrus Policy Lab at UC Berkeley. She's an associate research professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy, where she directs the Tech Policy Institute, uh, a collaboration to strengthen tech policy education, research, and impact. She's also director of Our Better Web, a program that supports empirical research, policy analysis, training, and engagement to address the rise of online harms. At Berkeley Law, she leads the project in artif artificial intelligence, platforms, and society. Finally, as if that wasn't enough, she also co-directs the UC Berkeley AI Policy Hub, an interdisciplinary initiative training researchers to develop effective AI governance and policy frameworks. Dr. Nanaki earned her PhD in mass communication at Penn State and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at UC Berkeley before joining the faculty there. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Brandy Nanaki. Yes, I got it. Great. Thank you so much. How is everybody today? Good. I think I would, how do I turn off this mic? I prefer the hand. I turned this one on, so we're good. And I prefer the handheld because of all of you. <laughs> Otherwise, I would never be able to see you, and you wouldn't be able to see me, and I've gotten approval to move to about this point, and then I have to move back. But hi, everybody behind the pillar. So I'm Brandy Nonick. I direct the Citrus Policy Lab at UC Berkeley. I wear a lot of hats, and I wear a lot of hats because the very nature of tech policy is multidisciplinary. So I have a foot in engineering, another foot in the law school, I have a hand, I guess, another part of me at the Goldman School of Public Policy. I'm everywhere on campus because in order for us to move forward in this space, we have to engage all of those disciplines. So before I, I start, my whole thing is about demystifying emerging technologies. And in part, because there are incentives to make technology sound more difficult than they actually are. One is for startups to kind of lean into the hype and get those venture capitalists to invest in them because it's the new greatest amazing shiny tool that's going to save humanity. Second is this idea that if it is so incredibly complex, there's no way members of Congress and state legislatures would have any idea of how to regulate it. It's just too difficult. It's got to be left to industry. Well, I don't agree. And to, after this presentation, you all will also, I hope, not agree with those tropes. Okay, so part of the problem that we have is this idea that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 
right? Like you think about chat GPT, you put in a prompt, you go to play with mid journey, you put in a prompt and it spits out this amazing image. And you're like, how in the world did that happen? Or like using chat GPT, um, write a skit or a poem or something and it spits it out and you're like, wow, that's really clever. I actually think chat GPT is so, so stupid itself that it appears to have intelligence. And I'll talk more about that why about why I think that. So it's sort of this idea of thinking of AI as this oracle, this all-knowing thing. It's so magic, right? You can talk into your phone and say, hey, Siri, do whatever, and it does it for you. But what's behind that is just data and models, and actually very simple ones on the continuum of different types of AI. And at the top of that list of people saying, look, the technology is so magical, it's so difficult and amazing and gonna have profound effects. The top of that, who's this person? Sam Altman, Sam Altman is the CEO of OpenAI. If you remember a few weeks ago, he was ousted by the board. Any of you remember that? Yeah, and he was ousted by the board because of this growing tension in Silicon Valley about whether or not to ramp up AI development because of all the great benefits for society or to tap the brakes because the technology is too powerful and we don't know the risks. Well, it didn't go really well for the board. They were essentially ousted and Sam Altman's back at the helm. But now Sam Altman went to testify before Congress and he testified before Congress to say, look, I've released ChatGPT. It's a very advanced technology and I'm very concerned about the harms it's gonna cause in the world. So esteemed members of Congress, I want you to know that I, since I built it and it's part of the work that I do, we at OpenAI are the best positioned to mitigate those risks. We don't really need your regulation, but if you do regulate us, we're gonna tell you the best way to do it. Okay, well there's some truth in that, right? I can follow along, I kind of agree a little bit. But also it's trying to lean more into that hype that the technology is so advanced, so mysterious, that only those with the insider knowledge are the ones to be able to regulate it. Okay, so what is AI? We're all talking about AI, artificial intelligence. We use the term all the time. I guarantee you when you're talking with somebody else and you're talking about AI, you have a concept of what AI is in your mind that's different from theirs. So let's do some level setting. And before I do that, a pitch. So I'm the host of a television show that's broadcast. Can you believe it? It's still broadcast. Talk about technology. So I'm the host of a show called Tech Hype, um, where I sit down with experts and I debunk emerging technologies. We sit down, we debate what are the real benefits, what are the real risks, and what are the technical and policy strategies we need to implement now that'll better ensure we can harness this technology for good. So it is broadcast, but then it is redistributed through YouTube where everybody watches content, right? No one's tuning in with bunny ears anymore, whatever. Um, but, okay, so Tech Hype, in that we have those main episodes, and then we also produce Tech Hype TLDRs, Too Long Didn't Read, where I analyze and summarize emerging tech policies. I know I'm talking to a policy audience, so you do like to read um, bills and, you know, like regulations, but most people don't. So I do really see short TLDRs. Um, we also launched our podcast last week, uh, which will have more content. So first, in the demystifying AI, you engage with, quote, AI every day in, in so many different ways. First, a recommender system. That is a simple form of, quote, AI. It's a form of machine learning. It's taking data points on you, your prior browsing history, and it's gonna feed up the content that you like. Did you know that Netflix actually chooses different images to show different people? Because like, they know what you might click on in that show. If you see a picture of like a gorgeous man or whatever, I don't know. But for me, always on Fridays, I love the Great British Baking Show. Guess what's at the top of my feed every Friday when they would release it? The Great British Baking Show, because they knew I wanted to watch it. So when we talk about regulating this technology, there's this spectrum of the types of technology. And I'll just go over that really quick, and then I wanna talk about this AI legislation database. So we can think of AI 
as narrow is the, the end, like over here. Narrow AI is a simple form of AI. It's essentially like logistical regression, linear regression, machine learning, okay? How many of you have taken statistics? Cool. Um, one of my favorite things is when students tell me they wanna do AI and I tell them to take stats and they don't want to. <laughs> That's the basis. So you start there and then all the way over here, you keep going, keep going, where we have sentient AI beings, right? Like Skynet. We're nowhere near here. We're clear over here. Even ChatGPT, even though it looks pretty cool, it sounds kind of smart, it's still very much closer to this side of the continuum. Now, at the Citrus Policy Lab, we track all AI legislation proposed at the federal level and in the state of California. We review each piece of legislation. Each piece gets a summary and it gets a topical tag. We tag it also with who introduced the legislation, a Republican, a Democrat, their home state, was it bipartisan, and what's the current status. And it's an Airtable, so you can go in there, you can actually download it as a CSV, you can play with it. You can see, okay, Republicans from the South, what types of legislation are they more likely to introduce? A Democrat from the Northwest, what are they more likely to introduce? It can be a lot of fun. Okay, when we're talking about AI definitions, I like to break it down into two categories of how we're defining AI. Now we have how AI is being defined in laws and institutions. Now at the top of that, in the United States, the National AI Initiative Act of 2020 is essentially our only big piece of federal law in AI. And that law, also I should point back, the database Guess how many pieces of legislation are in that database? There's like over 300. So there's a lot of pieces of, of legislation introduced, like always the bridesmaid, never the bride, never gets it passed, right? It just gets stuck in whatever. But the one that was able to pass, because it was a trailer bill on uh, military funding, is the National AI Initiative Act. And that formed the National AI Initiative Office within the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And their definition of AI is a machine-based system that can for a given set of human-defined objectives. Now, I emphasize that for a reason. Human-defined objectives, okay? And it makes predictions and recommendations. Well, guess what? New forms of AI can identify new objectives. And so they're not necessarily human-defined. So you're gonna see in a later definition from the EU that they say human or machine-defined. Now, NIST, our National Institute for Standards and Technology, developed the AI Risk Management Framework, which was released last year. And a lot has been happening in that space. Uh, we've been developing profiles for the NIST AI Risk Management Framework to demonstrate how you can actually implement it in practice. Now, note, this is a voluntary risk assessment. No company in the US is required to implement the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. So, think about that, and I'm gonna talk about the EU. Okay, so if we go to the EU, so the European Union, right before the holiday break, agreed to the terms of the European Union AI Act. The AI Act is the most comprehensive piece of AI legislation in the world. Now, why do we care about the EU? Well, we care about the EU because of the Brussels effect. Because the EU market is so big that any developer of an AI system, if they want to enter the European market, they need to be compliant. Now, all of you um, on your computers, you every day you go to a website and you have to click the accept or don't accept cookies. Okay, this is another example. The European Union passed the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which required people to consent to the collection of their data. Well, for a firm operating globally, it's more efficient for them to just roll out a feature across everything rather than just geoblock it to one location. I guarantee you we're gonna see the same thing in the AI development space, that an AI developer that's looking to sell their service in the European market will implement safety and security standards compliant with the EU, but then also roll them out in the United States. Okay, so the um, EU AI Act defines it here, you can see, based on a machine and or human provided data and inputs. I like this definition better. 
than the US one. Okay, so now we've talked about how AI has been defined by laws and institutions. It's probably pretty important we look at the actual field, right? So if you look at how AI is defined by computer science, it refers to the ability of machines to respond to stimulation and make decisions that normally require a human level of expertise. Now, machine learning is a sub um, discipline of AI within computer science. And there are so many different types of machine learning, right? We have supervised versus unsupervised, deep learning and reinforcement learning. And you can simultaneously have something that is supervised deep learning with reinforcement learning. You can have unsupervised machine learning with deep learning and reinforcement learning. You can have very many different combinations of these. And I want to give you some examples. Okay, so oh, look at this list. All of these supervised machine learning, unsupervised, reinforcement learning, deep learning, generative AI, foundation models, general purpose AI, it's too much, right? When I say AI to you, what do you think of first? Just yell it out and I'll repeat it for the listeners. Hmm? Y'all are too shy. Computer produced, okay. Robots. Robots, yeah. So probably something like generative AI, like ChatGPT, like those things that you play with, you feel like that's AI. Well, guess what? AI is in every part of your life right now, surreptitiously making decisions that affect your ability to exercise your rights, gain access to services. The information that you receive on social media or when you do a Google search, What's more prevalent in society, in our world right now, is machine learning. Now machine learning, it's not that complex. It's not. It's statistical pattern recognition or correlations in data. And there are three main types. There's supervised machine learning, where you're actually training the algorithm with labeled data set. An unsupervised machine learning model, where the algorithm itself will analyze and cluster unlabeled data sets. And then third is reinforcement learning, where you have an algorithm where you're optimizing it for a certain outcome, and it's just gonna do trial and error brute force until it starts to reach that outcome. So let's dig, dig deeper into this. Okay, so here's supervised machine learning. So you can see in the bottom left corner, I have labeled my data. You know, that, that green round thing with the sticky thing popping out of it, right? That's a green apple. Uh, it can also be red, right? looks like this, but look, okay, there's a green tomato, it looks a little bit different, I labeled that, right, it could be almost looking like a green apple, and then the red tomato, right? So I have told it, this is exactly what these are, this is what they look like, I take that labeled data, I train my model, I hold out a test data set, and I see how well does it perform on accurately predicting whether or not what it is looking at is a red apple versus a red tomato a green apple versus a green tomato. And this is called false positives and false negatives. So for example, if it takes out this green apple and it says, oh, that's a green tomato, that's a false positive. Okay, let's move to the next one. Now, unsupervised machine learning. And I'm presenting this in the way that the field has advanced. Essentially, we started with supervised. Now we're moving on to unsupervised machine learning, where we developed these algorithms that can identify what we call latent factors or latent features. So it's gonna look at that apple, tomato, and it's gonna identify certain features of it, right? The apple stem is more pointy, there's only one. The tomato, there's like five little shoots popping off. Um, the apple has a different texture, right? It's gonna look at those features and it's gonna to start to cluster. It's gonna say there's something about this. Now this one, because it's clustering without that human control, it can have more false positives and false negatives, right? Because sometimes maybe the tomato would have speckling on it, speckled in, it kinda of looked like an apple. So you would have to correct that in your model. Okay, now reinforcement learning. This is where we are right now. So in reinforcement learning, you take that unstructured data and you're going to try to output it. It's identifying those latent features 
and then you're going to punish it or reward it on whether or not it's achieving the goal of actually labeling them correctly. Now, ChatGPT uses reinforcement learning via human feedback. And that happens in two ways. Either when you play with ChatGPT and you go and you give it a prompt, and you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and it asks you, right? It asks you to comment and say, well, why wasn't this correct? You're helping to train that model. You're saying, no, this is a false positive or a false negative of how you're structuring this, and you're helping to train it. Also, the company itself hires a lot of people to go in and do this manually all the time. There is a very hidden cost in these models of humans training data. And there's actually a very large court case right now out of Kenya where they're suing OpenAI because they hired people there at a disgustingly low rate to train ChatGPT to not produce harmful content which meant that those people had to review and read incredibly violent, terrible content. Okay. So I've already mentioned some of the challenges in the machine learning. The supervised, it requires human beings, right? You have to actually train it, you have to label the data. Uh, unsupervised, it takes more computational complexity because it's gonna try to identify all of these latent factors. And there's a higher risk of inaccurate results. Quickly, for example, let's say that somebody is getting cancer treatment at the Mayo Clinic. Your doctor. <laughs> this is actually a space used in, AI is used a lot in doing screenings, um, looking at tissue samples, okay? So say you're at the Mayo Clinic and they send their data out to a third party that's collecting data not only from the Mayo Clinic but other clinics to identify whether or not cancer cells are prevalent. Well, it just so happens that maybe by the time everybody went to the Mayo Clinic, it was probably pretty like, likely that they had cancer. And actually on those Mayo Clinic slides was a little logo for the Mayo Clinic. So you already know what's happening. So what happened was the machine learning model didn't actually predict, they did at first, that in those images with the Mayo Clinic logo just in the image, that the cancer cells were present. But what it learned over time is that there's a very high correlation that if that logo appears, they have cancer. So then it's gonna start predicting just because that logo is present, the person has cancer. Scary, huh? Yeah. I think that's a lot scarier than generative AI. Um, and then we'll talk about reinforcement learning, but I wanna show you something really fun. Okay, let's see if I can get this to play. Okay, good, I can. Okay. So this is reinforcement learning. Okay, so they built this model. Okay, this is actually a machine learning model. And you can't see it, um, but I can. Hold on. I've got it, I think. I'm a Mac user, just bear with me. Cringe. Okay. I know you're all watching me like stumble through this. Okay, all right, so what you saw, okay, there's a boat. So this is actually a machine learning model doing reinforcement learning. And they said, okay, what we wanna do is we wanna optimize this model, just test it out, test if it can work. We want the boat to win the race, okay? It's gonna race against a bunch of other boats. The goal, win the race, you get the points, keep getting points, the more races you win, okay? So they did it. And like I was saying before, it's doing like this brute force of like reward function. So what it found out, the model had a uh, little trip up here, right? Do you see it's stuck in this infinite loop? Well, when it's stuck in that infinite loop, it keeps hitting these boosters. And guess what happens? It gets more points. So it actually gets more points by just sitting in this infinite loop than actually trying to win the race. Yeah, crazy. <sighs> okay, so this though is called, um, oh God, what do we call them? Like a, what do we, and I'm forgetting the word for it, but it's like a, I think I have it coming up, but it's like this false uh, reward function, a faulty reward function. It's actually what we call it. Okay, so it's a faulty reward function because they were optimizing 
essentially, they weren't optimizing to win the race, they were optimizing for points, right? And this looks like a really silly, stupid example, but if you are optimizing, let's say for cancer prediction, and you're not taking account that some of your slides might have a logo on it that's gonna end up being correlated and will cause cancer. Like, it'll predict it that it's cancer. I think that's my YouTube. I hear it. Okay, hold on. Did it stop? Okay. Okay, wait, I gotta go back over this. No, I wanted to get rid of these. Hi, guy. Okay. I probably could have just done this, couldn't I? Y'all, you PC users are looking at me like I'm crazy, maybe. Okay, so now we're also in this new space of deep learning. All right, so if we go back to that original diagram, we have computer science, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Now we have deep learning. Deep learning is actually also used by Google. When you do Google Browse, like you search in the Google search engine, it's not new. It's been around since the 1950s, but we've had significant advancements, right? We have the computational power and we have the data available for us to be able to do deep learning. Um, it's more complex, it does mimic the human brain, that's why it's called deep learning. It's based off of neural nets and I will show you what we mean there. So you have your input layer of data and it's gonna look at all the different correlations and combinations of that data. And at some point you can have so many layers where it's looking and that makes it pretty hard for humans to decipher, well, what are those correlations that it was looking at to predict the outcome? So sometimes this is referred to as black box algorithms. How many of you have heard that term? A few. Um, I will also say that it's not always true that they're a black box. There are things that you can use called counterfactuals in statistics where you just change some of these input variables and you see how it changes the performance. Right? You like hold it out and you can see. All right, so some of the challenges of deep learning it takes a large amount of data, powerful computing. Um, that's why we only have some of the largest companies like Google and OpenAI that has been funded in part by Microsoft able to do this. Um, there can be this lack of transparency, like I was saying, except that you can use things like counterfactuals. And then this idea of the faulty reward function Right? If you're not being conscious that if we're optimizing for X and X could be achieved through another method, we might not be getting the results we actually want. We're gonna get those unintended behaviors. And then where we are now in generative AI, those are deep learning models that can generate high quality text, images, audio, and other content. Um, so I'm sure all of you have played with ChatGPT and others, Bard, MidJourney. They're now being integrated into your software by default, so you buy a new Microsoft Office package, you're gonna have it built in. Okay, the other big thing that, that has been in the news and is really targeted in legislation are foundation models. Um, and because I'm at Berkeley, I just have to say it. Stanford coined this term and we all hated it. Not, because, not necessarily because it came from Stanford, but kind of. Um, <laughs> No, I do like Stanford, but they did coin this term, foundation models, and that was because up until this point, if you developed a machine learning model, you were developing it for a very specific task. Predict red apple, red tomato, green apple, green tomato. Now we have things called foundation models, where on top of it, you can do different types of things. On top, like ChatGPT, GPT-4 is a foundation model. That model, you can generate all sorts of different types of text, right? Different types of things. And then guess where we're going now? So that was large language models. The students upstairs, where are we going? We're going to the LMM world. What's LMM? Checks notes. Large multimodal models. So you're gonna start hearing more about LMMs and chat GPT 4+, is an LMM, and that means it can generate, I'll show you, cue next slide. Oh no, sorry. There. Why am I not? There, got it. 
Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, so we're going from LLMs to LMMs, where your model can both generate text and images and video and voice and all sorts of things, right, on top of it. Okay, another definition in the EU is this idea of general purpose AI, which fits within the generative AI, where it's actually being used across a variety of domains. So you can see they're not calling them out as these LMMs, large multimodal models, but that's essentially what this is. General purpose AI is an LMM. Okay, so now if we go to the regulation of AI. The big difference between the European Union and the United States is that they take an ex-ante approach and we take an ex-post approach. So ex-ante approach, they try to mitigate the harms before they happen by putting in safeguards, essentially making any developer of a high-risk AI system do a risk assessment, show that they have done that at, like, with some level of certainty <laughs> that those risks have been mitigated, and then it can be offered in the European market. Now, in the United States, it's a little bit harder for us to do that. Instead, right now, what we're relying on is established law. So if the harm occurs from an AI-enabled system, then you can sue, right? So if, for example, you apply for a job, your resume was screened, and it used terms that expressed your gender to say, no, you're not eligible. Well, that can be unfair. Not whatever, like you have to have equal opportunity for being able to get a job. You, so you can sue afterward. Not great, right? But there has been progress in the United States to do more of that ex ante approach, risk mitigation from the outset. If you remember earlier, I talked about the NIST AI risk management framework. That's essentially trying to do that, but it's a voluntary framework. No company has to do it. So the federal landscape of AI um, policy making. We started back in 2019, and actually during the Obama administration we started, then also um, during the Trump administration, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, I think did actually a pretty good job of pushing forward some guidance. But what really was crazy is now in 2023, well, now in 2024, but in 2023, we had the NIST AI risk management framework released, we had a blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights released, uh, the White House issued voluntary AI commitments where all of the large companies signed on. I wrote a piece about this that actually I think that this is really important and impactful because in the United States, in the absence of comprehensive federal legislation, the best we can do right now is have the company say that they're going to do better. But that also means as a consumer, you should put their feet to the fire. If they're not doing what they said they were going to voluntarily, don't use their service. I know that sounds really easy, but I know. We're all still going to use their service, but I would like to see some more pressure being put on those companies. And then we also see bipartisan um, frameworks uh, governing AI. Senator Schumer has been hosting a series of AI summits. And then the biggest deal is actually the White House issued its executive order on AI on October 30th of last year, and they outlined eight priority objectives for the federal government to ensure that they themselves are developing and using AI in a responsible way. So as I mentioned before in our Tech Hype series, we do these too long, didn't read TLDRs, and I have broken down the White House Executive Order on AI into eight parts, uh, each for one of the eight priority actions, uh, summarizing what the federal government's going to be doing. So I hope that you check them out. And then mentioned before the NIST Air Risk Management Framework, uh, they have four components to it, mapping the, the context and the risk associated with your AI system, measuring those risks, right? You can't manage what you don't measure, what you don't know. Uh, then you manage, and this is all within this governance system. Now, NIST is trying really hard to make sure that they are in alignment with other standards bodies, like the International Standards Organization and IEEE. Now, NIST went to the European Union and said, look, we know you're going to pass the EU AI Act, and as part of that, you'll have to do, companies will do these things called conformity assessments, which is pretty much like the NIST AI risk management framework. A conformity assessment says, look, I have identified the potential risks, these are the mechanisms I've used to mitigate those risks, and this is how I'm going to mitigate them moving forward. NIST went to the European Union and said, hey, 
if a US-based company does the NIST AI risk management framework, is that equivalent, can it be, to the conformity assessment? What do you think the EU said? Oh, no. No, we're not doing that. No, they have to still do our conformity assessment. So NIST, though, has tried to do what they call crosswalks to demonstrate how the NIST AI risk management framework is very complementary and similar to a conformity assessment. But companies right now, we're going to have to do both. They would have to do a NIST, if they wanted to, it's voluntary. They do a NIST AI risk management framework and the conformity assessment. So as part of that work that we're doing at Berkeley, we produce this report. Now, this report demonstrates how if you are the developer of a general purpose AI system, right, an LMM, a large multimodal model, how would you actually implement the NIST AI risk management framework? And we walk everybody through it in our report. It's about 170 pages. <laughs> no light reading. But that's how we demonstrate the work. And then NIST has also developed a playbook um, that has guiding questions for those govern, map, measure, manage. Uh, and I think that they have done a really good job. Okay, so like I've said before, in the absence of any comprehensive federal legislation, we're relying essentially on regulatory authority. Uh, and those agencies right now have been issuing reports and guidance on the AI space. Um, so right, for example, NIST, issued the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. The Federal Trade Commission is honestly the most powerful in this space because the Federal Trade Commission, through the FTC Act, has the right over unfair and deceptive practices. So that's their stick that they have against the companies because if a company develops an AI tool that's unfair or deceptive, they can kick in. They published a, uh, like a post kind of explaining their regulatory authority in this space. And actually next week, they're gonna have a large hearing with guests, it's online. <laughs> um, it's online and it's a full day talking about the AI governance space. Okay, so we have some states doing things. Um, I know uh, Assemblymember Buffy Wicks is introducing some legislation. Um, also Assemblymember Rebecca bauer Khan and others. Now, because there's this absence of federal legislation, we're seeing states doing it. Now, that could be a problem, right? Because you won't have harmonization. Except, like I said before, with the Brussels effect of the European Union, we can also have the California effect, which is documented. So if California gets out in front of it and puts in place a law, it can have a spillover effect on other states, right? Where they'll just take our legislation and put it through their legislature and get it passed for better or for worse. Uh, I already mentioned the European Union and their work. Um, they have been really pushing hard in responsible digital innovation. Um, so you can see all of the work that they've been doing here. The tech hype TLDRs, we will do one on the EU AI Act after the final text is released. And they're really short, like five minute videos for each you know, main priority action. So it's really digestible. I've already mentioned that, AI standards, intergovernmental. Of course, industry is leading in this space, so if I could leave you with one thing. Okay, so industry, even the EU AI Act, when it's passed into law, it doesn't say specifically what the companies have to do. It doesn't say you must do X, Y, and Z. It says you need to identify the potential risks, you need to mitigate those risks, and communicate it to us. So there is so much room for the companies to determine and demonstrate, essentially demonstrate what compliance looks like. And as part of the check on that, they have to publish these reports to the European Union. And the European Union will have those reports to say whether or not they did actually due diligence in identifying and mitigating risks. Um, a lot of people think that it's, okay, we have this legislation, this law passed, mid, you know, do build responsible AI systems. Well, actually doing that in practice is pretty difficult. Also, what's gonna happen, and something I'm really worried about, is because we're gonna have different states having different laws, uh, we have the European Union, if it's different from the US, if we ever pass a US federal law, that there will have to be compliance with all of these different rules. And it'll be inefficient for especially smaller companies to have that, um, like those people with those skills in-house. So they're gonna go to third parties. Right? 
And we're already seeing these third parties. You can see some of their names up here, like the Responsible AI Institute, uh, Credo AI, where they will assess an AI tool for you. You give them their tool, and then they will assess whether or not you have done appropriate risk mitigation in alignment with the EU conformity assessment. Um, they'll, they'll do the NIST AI risk management framework for you. My worry is that you're gonna see a lot of fly-by-night third parties that'll say, okay, for X amount of money, I'll make sure, yeah, you fulfilled all the requirements. So how do we trust those third parties? There's some ideas of actually licensing them, licensing those third parties and doing audits on them to make sure that they're actually doing a robust enough job of identifying and, and helping to mitigate the risk for those companies. Okay, and then I do have my contact information, but before that, and I'll go back to it, please check out TechHype. It's really cool. We have really cool people. Uh, how many of you know Bill and Ted? From Bill and Ted's, like, like yeah, like the people of my generation. <laughs> but I got, I interview Alex Winter because he now makes documentaries about the effects of technology on society. And it's like an amazing interview. Um, so, yeah, I do have some cool people. And then our podcast there, if you'll check it out. And then there's my contact info if anybody wants to take a picture. <laughs>